arts in the fine arts program and the visual and critical studies program. Welcome from wherever you are and on behalf of <clears throat> CCA and the sculpture, individualized and print programs. Thank you so much for joining us today, April 27th, 2022 for the BFA thesis conversations prevented by these, presented by these five talented seniors. The talks you'll see each of them give today are just one of the final projects these artists produce as they move towards the completion of their degree and their graduation. So thank you, families, classmates, teachers, and friends for supporting them. And a thank you to Ingrid Wells and Ava, Ava Morton for all of your help with organizing. And before we go any further, I'd like to make our land acknowledgments. California College of the Arts campuses are located in Huichin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of Chochenyo and Ramiatush Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, here and around the world. And we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. If you are unsure of whose land you are currently residing upon, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. All right, today we have students from the three departments I mentioned. Each of these five, Ernest Strahal, Hilary Lopez, Victoria Z. Gardner, Gordon Fung, and Eden Cho, will make a 10-minute presentation sharing some highlights of their work in life. Immediately following the presentation, there will be 10 minutes of questions, comments, and feedback from the two respondents. Sadly, we don't have time for the audience to participate in person in this Q&A, but you can add comments and affirmations into the chat and please do. These chats will also be recorded and will be available afterwards for each of the presenters, sort of like a virtual guest book. So please do leave a shout out. The whole event will last about an hour and 50 minutes. I've been asked to remind you to please keep yourself muted or we will all have a hard time during the presentations. Next, I'd like to introduce our two distinguished respondents, Julia Cousins and Mia Foyer. Julia Cousins, our outside respondent, is a Sacramento-based American artist known for a diverse body of work that embraces unconventional materials and methods and includes drawing, sculpture, installation art, and writing. Her work has been shown internationally and throughout the United States and is in the collections of many Bay Area museums. It has also been recognized with the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Fellowship in the Visual Arts, a Roswell Museum and Art Center Artist in Residence Grant, and an Art Matters Visual Artist Fellowship. In addition to working as an artist, Cousins has taught at several Southern California universities and writes about contemporary art. She lives and works on Merritt Island in the Sacramento River Delta community of Clarksburg and maintains a studio in downtown LA. She joins us from Clarksburg today, so her internet is a little fragile, so that she may be turning off her camera a few times just so that she can still make sure that she's listening and viewing your presentations. Our second respondent, Mia Foyer, is an associate professor in the sculpture department here at CCA. She examines connections between landscapes, spirits, objects, histories, origins, futures, mines, synthetic materials, landfills, internalized anti-Semitism, internalized fat phobia, and unknown ancestral lineages. Her research-driven practice has led her to many extraordinary sites, such as the strip mines of the Alberta tar sands, forgotten coal mines in the Arctic, and a jewel vault beneath the federal bank of Tehran. 
Foyer solo exhibitions include the Atlantic Contemporary Art Center, the Corcoran Museum in Washington, DC, and Dream Farm Commons in Oakland. In 2016, she exhibited work in the first female-only exhibition at the Saatchi Gallery, and she'll exhibit a major public artwork as part of the Ex Muro Public Arts Initiative in Quebec City, Canada this June. Now it's time to begin our first presentation. We are going in reverse alphabetical order today. So we will begin with Ernest Strauhall. Ernest, take it away. Okay, let me share my desktop. Um, cool. Is my microphone on? Correct. Okay, cool. Um, hello, my name is Ernest Strawhall, and today I will give my BFA thesis conversation talk. I am based in Oakland, California, but I grew up in Sacramento, although I was born in San Francisco. I'm interested in print media, sound art, and ambient music. I first developed an interest in art in high school when I would design clothing and posters for my friends with the word processor on my computer. I had no idea that Adobe Photoshop existed as a high schooler, but even if I did, I wouldn't know how to use it. So a word processor was my design studio for a while. One of my biggest artistic influences are really badly designed websites. I think there's something so beautiful about how raw and bold the colors and designs of these websites are. Clearly, these are the purest forms of art as the people who make these websites often do not know HTML and they don't have any design guidelines or 400 year old European layouts weighing down on them. My second artistic influence is Chinese restaurant signage. Just like bad web design, the people who make signs for these Chinese restaurants aren't trying to impress anyone visually. They're just trying to draw attention to their business. And that business is making really good Chinese food. I love the bold colors and the signs and the size of the type and how the type is often stretched or compressed instead of being treated properly by a professional. Before I move on to the next slide, I want to say one more thing about Chinese restaurants. I have developed a skill that has served me quite well in San Francisco, which is that all of the worst Chinese restaurants I've ever eaten at always have really clean brand design or signage and all the, all the best Chinese restaurants I've eaten at have poorly designed menus, wallpaper, signage, all that. Uh, moving on, I want to talk about work I made in 2021 that influenced my exhibition. In the summer of 2021, I finished my first solo album relating to experimental music, performance art, and sound art. This album in question is a soundtrack to Joseph Boys' 1974 performance, I Like America and America Likes Me. In this performance, he is taken on a stretcher out of uh, the New York airport to an art gallery where he spends three days confined with a coyote. At the end of the three days, he bonds with the coyote and then goes back on a flight to Germany. During the pandemic, I was locked in my room with my laptop for three months and I thought, what could I make out of this? I'm a screen printer, but I didn't have a, a screen printing studio. And um, I also do some sculpture, but I didn't have a sculpture studio either. So I opened up Ableton on my laptop and I just made this album. This way of working with sound shaped my print artworks in the fall 2021 semester and almost every printed work I made in my screen printing class related to sound in some way. Now I want to talk about my exhibition. My exhibition is called Record Store and the theme of this exhibition was to recreate my earliest childhood memories of walking around record stores with my father. When my family moved from San Francisco to Sacramento, they were a little bit out of whack and they wanted to know the area better. So my father made himself comfortable in Sacramento by taking me to record stores. I remember being scared of all the rock posters and metal singers with paint on their faces. And I also remember not even being tall enough to look at the CDs that were stacked up on the shelves, but it was fun nevertheless going to these strange places with my father. 
This exhibition aims to take the viewer back to a time and space when objects and concepts like vinyl and CDs were completely abstract and to focus on the beauty of these materials like vinyl, CDs, and laser discs in, as opposed to the information embedded in them. In, ad in addition, this seemed like the perfect progression for my interest in sound as record stores are places that sell physical manifestations of sound objects or you know, just vinyl records which literally have sounds imprinted in them. This piece is called a uh, double-sided record. On one side, there's an abstract ink composition. And on the other side, I've taken a barcode and I've warped it and uh, like stretched it in Photoshop to become this kind of gooey blob of barcode. Um, I wanted it to represent how as special and as unique as each album in a record store is, uh, it still filters through these modes of consumption. And, you know, you have to go to a record label and they print it out and they have to package it and then they have to sell it to people. So it's like, on one hand, it's a very individualized artistic expression. And on the other hand, it's just also a product. So this piece is called Double Sided Record. There's also an interactive part in the exhibition where I have it playing endlessly on a record player and people are encouraged to walk up to it and just mess with the needle and scratch it because that's what I did with my dad's record player as a kid. Uh, just really not, it's not great for vinyl, but it was really fun to do. Uh, here's another shot of the exhibition with the double-sided records hanging off of the ceiling, along with two other pieces that I'm going to talk about. Uh, this piece is called Digital Record, and uh, it's a wall of laser discs, which is five feet long and four feet tall. Uh, out of all the pieces in the exhibition, this is the prime example of me falling in love with the material as uh, the light reflected off these discs is just so entrancing. And I can't believe that laser discs never took off. I'm kind of upset that VHS tapes and uh, DVDs are all the rage because these were so much fun to work with. The reason I call it digital record is because I'm projecting uh, footage of myself as a toddler and a baby on top of them. So it's also a record of my own life. And in the previous slide, these reflections are bouncing off of the floor to create this um, moving light pattern on the floor. This piece is called Covered Record Covers. Um, it's 18 feet long and seven feet tall. I wanted to recreate some of the abstract colors and blocks and shapes that were in my head as a kid when I went to these record stores because you know you don't really remember the text or which singer or what which album was on the walls as a kid. You just remember these blocks of color. So I printed on a ton of vinyl record covers and I used PVC to glue them to canvas. I wanted these covers to be an exercise in color and color mixing. And I made all of these strokes with a screen printing paddle instead of a paintbrush. These two records that you see are two of six vinyl compositions that I made under the title of Broken Record. These are uh, screen printed abstract compositions across six vinyl records. And then I laser cut them and then I mixed and matched the pieces to create a stained glass effect. I, going into the exhibition record store, I wanted to play around with the metaphor of a broken record. And these were originally going to be on the record player playing endlessly except the, the gaps caused by the laser cutter did not allow the needle in the vinyl record player to travel along the vinyl record. Moving on from my exhibition, I plan to continue my practice of mixing print media and sound art at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Gordon Fung, another individualized student, will also be attending SAIC in the fall. 
We're going to make a ton of interdisciplinary work regarding sound, video, performance, and installation. I'm already enrolled in a couple of sound classes at SAIC, and I'm planning to also major in print media at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I believe that an MFA degree is the right step in my artistic journey, and it will give me more knowledge and resources uh, that I didn't really utilize during my time at CCA. Uh, I'm also going to do a live audio visual performance with Gordon Fung this Friday at the San Francisco campus in Timken Hall. So be there, be there or be square. <laughs> Here's my contact information. I don't have any last words, but you can follow me at Ernest Straw Hall on Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, SoundCloud. I'm pretty sure I still have my space. And my email is hello at ernststrawhall.com. My school email is going to be estrawhall at scic.edu. And my portfolio website is studiostrawhall.com. I would like to thank the respondents for their time and my fa family and faculty for their support. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. That was great. So, now, now. Uh, our first respondent will be Julia, who will respond for five minutes. Cool. So um, congratulations, Ernest. Um, wow, you, you um, that was a lot. Um, I just, uh, could you hear me? Can you oh, hear yeah, me? I can, I can hear you. You, you look and sound great. Um, just, um, a local note. Did you ever go to Tower Records in Sacramento? I have been to Tower Records. You know, and I've also been you know, to That the was the original. Tower was the original, Sacramento was the original tower records launched in sacramento in a drugstore it's it's a thing in 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 sacramento it's no more but um anyway it was right next so to the um right next to the tower theater yeah tower hence the name anyway i um so there's a lot going on i um and I don't quite know where to um, to start. It's you know it's a you have a very complex practice. Um, I am not as um, conversant in in the uh, in the forms that you're working with. Um, and uh, one of the th things that was frustrating for me is how there was no sound. I mean, is there, uh, how might you in the future going forward in a presentation, when you're talking about your work, how you might, um, you know, insert actual, you know, your, your sound. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, uh, this is way above my pay grade, I'll just say that. So I don't, I don't know the technology, I don't know what's possible, but but um but it's a significant component of of your practice so um that would be i would be interested in in that i um your your visual aesthetic i was uh very attracted to the kind of the dissonance the um the uh the kind of anti-aesthetic the signage the uh the sort of um uh mechanical color palette um is uh is intriguing it's in it 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 certainly speaks to the cacophony i think that um some of your work seems to address the cultural cacophony um you know how you how you're working with um text um 
signage. Um, I was um, a little confused. And again, this might be just me, probably is, um, as to what was a print and what is an actual object. What, um, you know, so was I looking at actual discs or was I looking at prints of discs? Mm -hmm. um, I loved, I loved, I loved the record player. Um, and I love the, the whole idea of viewers being able to come in, circulate around your installation, um, scratch across, lift, I mean, you know, manipulate the, uh, the mechanisms um, so that their sort of, you know, their gesture affects the work, I think is really, um, is really interesting. And something, there might be something uh, of that for you going forward is incorporating those ad hoc kinds of experiential gestures from the audience. Um, but, you know, smart work. Thank you. So, um, I guess we're ready, Mia, for you to jump in. Okay. Ernest, first of all, congratulations on getting into uh, the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Is that where you're going? That is. And that's also where your collaborator got into? Yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, that is terrific news um, for both of you. And I'm excited to hear about what you both produced there, both collaboratively and separately. Um, I thought your presentation was pretty good. Uh, I agree with Julia that some sound in different parts of your presentation uh, would have been helpful or actually just would have made it um, a more, uh, just like a richer, and it would have given us a richer understanding of what it is you do because sound is such an important component. You talk about sound as sculpture at one point um, and I would have loved to hear some of that sound in your presentation, even for a moment here and there. Um, I also was really, I, I, I really loved how you opened your presentation, giving us some, uh, some context uh, or, or sharing with us some of the cultural, uh, some of the things I don't know in the world that 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 influence you, like badly designed websites or signage on Chinese food restaurants. Um, however, you 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 spoke about the Chinese restaurant signage and the state of different Chinese restaurants, and then you made then you sort of like made this comment about the it's all it was almost like the shittier. The, the signage and the shittier, the, 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 the decor and the shittier the menus, the better the food. And then you just sort of dropped off on that. And I actually, I think that's an interesting observation. And I'm, and I'm wondering if that there's more to dig into there in terms of the intersections that some of these communities, uh, you know, ha, ha, confront in terms of poverty, in terms of um, gentrification. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know exactly what that conversation is or what or where that research could take you, but I'm interested in it. And I didn't, I, I, I was sort of put off by the way that you just dropped and then moved on without really expanding a little bit deeper into that. Um, it felt like you were sort of making a joke of it. And then you just kind of flipped right into your practice. And I would have loved to hear just a little bit more on that observation that you were making um, and, and, and how it ultimately influences your work. I felt like there was a little bit of a disconnect between the, uh, between the signage and the badly designed websites and the work that you were showing us that was uh, painted like the sort of more painterly pieces. I also couldn't really tell if they were prints or if you were painting directly on top of records or 
it like like were those did they start off as objects that you painted or printed on top of that I was a little unclear as well I also it was a little unclear to me if the records existed like if they were objects themselves that can be played and then it seemed like one of them did play but I still was like a little unclear as to what was a sculpture and what was an what was a print um let's see what else? Um, I loved your memory that you shared with us of you and your father uh, wandering around Sacramento, exploring record shops, and that and that being a way for the two of you to connect with a new city to go to record stores. I actually thought that that was uh, there was like so much power and it was so visual. Like I, I immediately imagined you and your dad. And then I imagined me and my dad and the the spaces that we, that, that, you know, like for me and my dad, it was always hockey rinks. That was always the spaces that we, that we would be in together. And I've actually, to this day, I'm still making art about hockey rinks because it was special, a special spot for me and my dad. So I really loved that. And I, um, I'm excited to see where where your where your work goes. Do you? Uh, yeah, I don't know. How am I on for time, there, Maria? <laughs> Just about done. Yeah. Uh, congratulations, Ernest. And I've seen your installations before in the gallery in East Oakland. Uh, I've seen you and Gordon collaborate on a like that large scale installation. Uh, it didn't seem like that type of work was in your senior show. And um, I would, I would, fall, I would chase that down again. Once you get to Chicago, finding weird spaces to do um, multi-projection sound, you know, heavy stimuli, loud uh, installations. Because I thought you guys killed it. You did a great job. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ernest, Julia, and mm -hmm. Mia. And we're going to move on to. Our next student who will be Hillary Lopez. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see? Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Hillary. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Hillary Lopez. Hillary Ann Lopez. I'm an individualized major with a minor in ecological practices. And I'm a 23-year-old Sagittarius who loves roller skating, crocheting, and of course making art. <laughs> I come from Northern Jersey and a Dominican family. These are my two older sisters right here. <laughs> and of course, my mom and my dad. I'm currently based in San Francisco and my work revolves around childhood healing and femininity. Ever since I was little, I loved expressing myself through art, whether that be through doodles or making my own recreation of the Medusa. <laughs> Growing up, I knew I wanted my life to revolve around something I loved. I started developing my skill in drawing and painting as an outlet, taking on as many art extracurriculars as possible, even trying out things that I wasn't sure about, like comics and pointillism. I found my passion through color towards the end of high school, where I ultimately decided that the best, <laughs> the best solution for me for college was illustration, or so I thought, as I applied for colleges on the West Coast. I'm interested in a lot of different artists, so I'm going to go through them kind of quickly, but they're from different backgrounds and different mediums. This first one is Agatha Ole Oleksiak, also known as Olek. And I love her work because of the beautiful usage of color in the crochet bombings, and as well as childlike fun in communities. Yayoi Kusama for their usage of reflection and, immers and immersive experiences, as well as bright pops of color. Laura Owens for the splashes of texture and additions of other materials, such as like buttons. Ellen Gallagher's 
feminist collages that speak on the perception of the female body and also cosmetics. And finally, Tiffany Turner for their gorgeous handmade paper flowers, which speak on the beauty of growth and change. To begin my presentation, I'd like to speak a bit about some older pieces that I have that have driven me to explore my artistic voice. This is a vacuum I repurposed for a sculpture project in 2019. It was one of the first times I truly embraced the playfulness of breaking apart objects using found materials and having fun in a sort of interactive and performance way um, in art. So I have a short video to break that down a bit. <laughs> so I'd break you as a commentary on the mistreatment of the female body. I wanted to put the memories of um, all the awful sexist things that people have said to me, usually men that I was hooking up with. And so the vacuum is smothered with comments like you could have a nice boy if you weren't so loud, talkative, defensive, or dramatic. Um, as I break down the body like vacuum, you can see I pull out the zig from the small drawer above the breast and open up the, the piece by removing it. <laughs> it's impossible to enter the piece in the This is my way of pushing it. I can be loud and dramatic and beautiful without the kind of approval for anyone. Um, because my true beauty lies within me and not something that can be seen within stereotypes like domestic qualities and sex objects. Your Dirty Little Secret is a connection to the little black book exploring my sexuality and kinks originated mainly from porn, movies, and boys asking for nudes. While it's something that I'm not always been proud of, I have also never regretted any decision I've made as I continue to have sex and explore my sexuality. Though one of the things that it did get to me was the per promiscuity created in between me and my chances to have a romantic relationship with any one of these men that I might be hooking up with. So the book is a progression of my embracement into self-love from including these objects that were inflicted with me or inflicted on me <laughs> or used with a partner to that of um, ones that I would use on my own for self-exploration rather than relying on another one to make me feel fulfilled. This next book, Fuckboy Blues, is a journey through my past relationships with six men in particular. Each one of the men I mentioned has told me one way or another that we would be together. Yet I found myself in the same state of confusion, hovering between love and sex. I wanted to be known as sexy and felt as endearing to be given so much and to give so much and to be available that in a way they had no other option but to realize how great we would be together. <laughs> Unfortunately, this led me down a repeated cycle of pleasing men who never had the intention to stay with me. And in fact, one of the main reasons most of these men separated from me was because of my provocativeness, because I was so easy or I could be for anyone, even if my loyalty stood for only one person at the time. What if I could change my way of thinking? What if I, would I really want to? And reflecting on these questions on the last page, has helped me open up to heal those wounds from the tragic remarks that were made and given to me by those relationships with these men. Here's a small video. I'm not gonna show the whole thing. Skip forward a little bit. So there's some few interactive pieces like me taking photos, um, going through the photos, in these conversations with certain men on my drive to their places. And of course, the last page, which shows the six men that I was involved with. Bloom is a piece about growth and puberty. I used essential oils to bring out the beauty and menstruation, not only visually, but also through smell. I recreated this piece for my exhibition play date as an interactive piece where people can go up and coat menstrual products in fake blood. So here there's um, displayed with ripped jeans to symbolize bullying that I went through as I bled through my pants in middle school. 
Another piece that was shown in my exhibition is Pop's Chi. It represents um, how it feels to pick yourself up after hardship. And I remember distinctively flipping my bike over when I popped my chain and how all my friends would look at me while I struggled to push it back into place. So I represented um, how it feels not only to put yourself back up, but the celebration that comes with that as well. Another piece that was shown in my exhibition is Room Room. It's a tribute to my family, specifically my sister Clarissa, who has helped me grow not only as an artist, but as a person. I've decorated it um, during one of my lowest moments as a way to help push myself into creativity through just having fun like a child, spraying and pouring, ripping, adding bells, gems, and of course, slinkies, which was probably my favorite part. <laughs> Okay, so here's a look at my full exhibition play date, which consisted of um, a performance piece, Rage Rug, Crochet Tent, and also a children's mobile. For the future, my main goal after graduation is quite simple, to keep playing. I want a career that allows me to travel while I make, maybe get into a few residencies while I cross the country in my RV. <laughs> I thought deeply about getting into an internship at an art gallery or a museum for experience in curating and more firsthand knowledge about the art world, as well as working on children's illustrations and maybe even toy design, which I feel like would be really fun. <laughs> I'd love to get into crochet bombing as my love for textiles grows. And I've thought about graduate school maybe four or five years from now um, at Virginia Commonwealth University for sculpture, which was actually recommended to me by Mia. Hi. <laughs> so eventually I'd also love to start my own business under the name Helium Girl. But yeah, that's all. Here's my website, email, and Instagram handle if you want to follow me on there. <laughs> and thank you so much for listening so attentively. Okay, should I stop sharing my screen? <laughs> yes, please. Okay. All right, that was great. Thank you. And now, we're ready for... Mia to speak first, responding to Hillary's presentation. All right, awesome, Hillary. I <laughs> have not seen you in a few years. It's so yeah. good to see you. It's so good to see how your work has developed since that sculpture class long, long ago, uh, yeah. or it, it feels like long, long ago. Um, I thought your presentation was really fun, exciting, colorful. You were so, um, you had so much joy. You had so, you were so much positivity, lots of smiles, lots of giggles. I, I it, 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 your delivery really embodied, I feel like what the work embodies, um, almost. Until, <laughs> until, until the work starts to touch upon trauma and um, sort of these dark corners that lurk kind of behind all the joy and pleasure mm -hmm. and tickling and giggling. And then there's like this, um, almost like this little misogyny monster that's just yeah. like creeping and peeking out from behind all of your works. Uh, and, and maybe I see that because I've worked with you right like long ago and I, and I know a little bit about um, your story and, and, and sort of what you're interested in making work about or in response to. I really appreciated how vulnerable you, you, you are when talking about your work, when making your work. Mm -hmm. um, I think sexuality is still, it's still, it's still something that um, it's, it's, it's risky to talk about, um, especially as a woman of color to just get out there and boldly talk about their sexuality. I really, um, I think it's great. I think it's awesome that you are, uh, that you a allowed yourself to be that vulnerable and just shared what was driving your work. You talked a little bit about toy design. 
yeah. as something <laughs> that you might or you might be interested in doing in the future. I I immediately, as soon as you said toy design, I thought about sex toy design. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I'm I'm just I yeah, I don't know. I that's just kind of a thought that I had. Um I'm sure someone has mentioned Tracy Eamon to you before, who yeah. is a British artist who has made all sorts of pieces about former relationships or uh, her former sexual partners. Mm -hmm. um, I really, the piece that I had never seen before, and I'm sorry, I didn't come to your show, but there was something about popped chain. I, I really, I, I, I kind of wanted to go back to that slide. I wanted to kind of stay on that for a minute. I really wanted to investigate it. I appreciated the video, all the videos that you shared. Um, I think that you have a talent of taking found objects and transforming them into stories, um, of taking a found object and injecting it with narrative and with poetry. And I'm just really, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm not, <laughs> I'm not totally sure um, how to fill every second of my five minutes <laughs> in this moment, but um, what residencies, uh, have you looked at any residencies so far? Um, well, we, we spoke briefly, I think, uh, about um, the ecology one, and I thought about, um, you know, going in there and, and trying that out just because, you know, I'm still in the area and it would be nice. And I feel like it's a great opportunity for me to reuse those um, materials that you were mentioning. Yeah. I love working with found objects, especially things that are just like on the side of the road. Yes. Um, so yeah, right. something like that. I, I'm still looking across the country because my mom definitely wants me to be back in Jersey. <laughs> but for the most part, that's kind of where I'm headed. Yeah. Well, I know that there is a residency program. There's Recology in SF that you can apply to that gives artists a studio and access to the dump. The El Cerrito Recycling Center on this side of the East Bay is also starting a residency program uh, very, very soon where artists will get a space to work and access to the dump. And then also, I think there's a really good one in Phil in Philly. Um, All right. Thank you, Mia. Yeah. <laughs> and also, you. Don't worry, remember to look at the list that I posted to Moodle for access of uh, places to look for residencies. Okay. So yeah. now, Julia, um, we have your response to her presentation. Oh, you're muted. I think I'm muted. <laughs> okay. Well, um, congratulations. Um, Thank you. You are you are an ebullient spirit, uh, which absolutely um, shines, and um, your work. Um, your presentation was very good and I, um, your work is curious because for me, because it has this um, childlike uh, quality, uh, playful toy, um, um, scrapbooky uh, kind of <clears throat> aesthetic. And, um, and with your persona, also equally sort of playful, um, um, you know, I'm thinking there's this uh, kind of weird um, uh, play school idea um, where we, where your exhibition is, we, we come into this arena and, you know, were given this uh, sort of invitation to play. Um, but I agree that there is a darker tone, which gives the work um, for me, which really gives the work traction. Um, 
there it's both alluring um dangerous sweet um you you have the potential for triggering um a lot of tones in your work i i i would like there's two things that i would say i would i think in your presentation you might slow down a little bit in your in 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 talking and i would slow down in presentation and let us linger more over over what you're showing and i would also wonder what would happen if you focus if you took um like the toys um and sort of simplified and started to focus on the allure of uh some of these objects like the sex toys like what both slow down and scale up there my i'm getting that your work is small that you have that the books are scrapbook that the toys you hold in your hand uh, that it, yeah everything is about the same size i would be interested in seeing what would happen if you you know radically um scaled up and what what that would cause you to how you would make different decisions um what that would require of you in terms of how you would focus how you would um you know simplify maybe to move the material further like i was really attracted you had those um clay flowers sort of clay florets yeah they were um, handmade the, paper those flowers. were paper flowers those were really those were really delicious they were both sort of they were sweet and icky um and what if they were larger um if you if you sort of like looked at that looked at that weird allure that you're flirting with in in the the, the material allure yeah. um i agree i agree that your vulnerability um you know dealing with your sexuality dealing with trauma um is uh that's tender territory um i love the vacuum cleaner i love the vacuum cleaner as the surrogate body i thought that i mean that was very funny um and that's where you have that that's where that's very rich that you could be both funny and um dark and um uh, you know it i just really will be interested in following where this this work takes you and again congratulations Thank you so much. That's exactly what I was going for. So <laughs> all right. Thank you to all three of you. That was great. And our next presentation will be Victoria Z. Gardner. Awesome. Share my screen. Please. Okay. Doo -doo -doo. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Victoria Z. Gardner. I'm a sculpture major. Um, I, I was born and raised in Lexington, Kentucky, um, but I've been based in San Francisco since 2018. Um, my creativity was always encouraged. Um, growing up an only child, entertaining myself was a high priority of mine. So my dad always kept canvases for me um, in the closet, which is shown in the first photo. And the second photo is my eighth grade graduation dress, which I made out of trash bags, <laughs> which was a continuing theme to my last photo, which is my high school um, senior prom dress, which is also made out of trash bags and shows vast improvement, if I do say so myself. Um, a big inspiration of mine is Tracy Evan. Um, 
her work has inspired me in a really direct way, especially these two pieces. Um, everyone I've ever slept with um, from 1963 to 1965, 1995, um, and her piece, My Bed, um, from 1998. Um, my piece, uh, Haha Me Too, I made in early 2019 um, at the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, it was inspired by Tracy Emmons, Everyone I've Ever Slept With and the Cape from the Handmaid's Tale series. Um, this was a reflection on the Me Too movement and the phrase, haha, me too, was the most common and casual phrase I heard or said after coming home from my first semester of college. When assault would be brought up, it was so common, it felt normal. And under the transparent fabric um, are names of men who have sexually harassed or assaulted me personally. Um, and the names are cut up out of the clothing that I was wearing at the time. Um, and I decided to document this piece in a school hallway, kind of emphasizing how most of the time it's your peers or people that you know and not the stereotypical um, assumption that it's strangers. Um, and next I have TV Time Bomb, which I made in 2018. Um, also at the San Francisco Art Institute. There are two woodcut prints with a spray foam frame um, put together. And it's kind of my take on the news or media. Uh, the two news anchors um, look the same, but have opposing political party colors. And they have like little bombs in their mouth, like they're about to explode. Um, and they're screaming through the TV that looks like it's been blown up, delivering somewhat of like explosive news. Um, like most of us during the pandemic, um, the pandemic has like really changed and impacted my practice and my life from having to transfer from SFAI to CCA and converting my apartment into my studio. Um, it has completely consumed my practice <laughs> inside and out. Uh, these are photos from my opening last month um, for my show, Stuck. Um, it's a reflection on the pandemic. Stuck inside, stuck in time, stuck in bed, stuck alone. Um, which ironically, I have COVID right now and I've been, in stuck, I've been stuck inside and alone for a week and a half now. Um, and I'm lucky that I'm able to talk today. <laughs> Last week I couldn't. Um, um, this is the bed from Stuck. Um, the headboard is plush and inspired by the popular gate design um, on homes in San Francisco. Um, the purple pillow has a photo sewn in plastic and it's a photo of my friends hugging for the last time before my friend was deported back to Canada. And I kind of feel like it's a ode or a sentiment to kind of like our final hugs before being stuck. Um, and sometimes you don't get to hug those people again or maybe never see them again. Um, then below that is the tab bar, which displays like popular websites um, that were used during the pandemic and in general, um, and then below that was the quilted Zoom screen, um, kind of mixing old methods with um, our new like digital landscape. Um, the screen is like huge and ominous um, and kind of like an inescapable object. And um, this green blanket was actually supposed to be my great great grandmother's quilt that I was going to place underneath um, this new um, kind of quilt, but uh, the quilt got lost in the mail forever and I no longer have it. So moving forward. Um, these are masked curtains that I made. So I collected all of my own personal masks that I wore for the past few months and sewed them into a quilted design. Um, and even at the bottom, it's all the all the little ear loops. 
um, which was kind of a happy coincidence. Um, I used the color red and it's like a satin red, um, kind of like uh, the like theater curtains um, <laughs> in a theatrical sense. And just again, like mixing an old method with like this new material um, that's like so common in our everyday lives uh, now. And um, yeah, just like comparing like curtains to like a mask or like, and, and how when we were stuck inside, like all we had was like the window to like really look out of, to like see what was actually going on um, when we were stuck inside. Um, yeah, so like what's behind the curtain and like what's behind the mask kind of idea. Um, these are photos I took um, in rural Kentucky and in San Francisco during um, 2020, um, kind of placing these photos together to show the South, which a lot of people don't see um, in a positive light or even pay attention to. And then putting it together with San Francisco, kind of showing the contrast, but also the similarities between the two during like very uncertain times. Um, in the show, the photos were sewn into plastic, like the same kind of plastic that was like, like the thin kind of plastic that was like used during like early pandemic when people were just like trying to find anything to make a, a cover between like the cashier and the customer or um, things like that. So what comes next? Well, um, I'm working on pieces for a fashion show that's gonna be in Oakland, May 28th. And I'm also working on a piece for a show in San Francisco on June 4th. Um, I have a small earring business that I um, will have more time to focus on after graduating, um, which are little sculptures for your ears. I call them lucky loops. Um, which I can't believe I don't have some on right now. Um, but my long-term goal um, is to take my education back home and put it back into my community, which is something that my dad um, really emphasized when he dropped me off in San Francisco in 2018. So this is a building that um, my dad owns back home that I've used oh, parts of um, as like uh, an art studio. And I've painted on the side of it and da 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 da, da throughout the years. Um, but my goal is to go back home and make it into like an open studio space for my community and have like workshops. Um, and then there's an open like storefront kind of in the front. Um, and I would like to make like a little community gallery to display people's work. Um, yeah. And thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Um, huge thank you to my family for endlessly supporting me and all the lifelong friends that I've made um, from the opportunity to go to both of these institutions and all the people I've met in San Francisco. And um, I'm so lucky and I'm excited for the future. Yeah. Great job. Thank you. So, Julia, it's your turn to go first. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say because of your textile connection and background. Well, congratulations, Victoria. Um, I'm sorry that you are having to recover from COVID and, you know, hopefully you get out from under this fast and fully. Yeah. Um, your presentation was terrific. Um, I immediately responded to the couture. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, couture and sculpture um, is such a uh, rich um, territory uh, to, um, to work in and I, and I, would uh, so I was very interested that you you know are sort of like slowly getting into that through the earrings which are uh, look like they're kind of like stuffed you, you know they're, they're they are sculpture 
Um, and um, I was, you know, I'm very attracted to kind of the clarity in your work, um, your, the simplification of your forms, the, you know, it's very graphic, um, translating um, uh, technology, uh, icons, iconography, um, uh, objects into fabric stuffed you know, fabric forms, I think is, <clears throat> is interesting. The, um, the curtains, the masked curtains is a knockout. That's a knockout. It's, um, it's bold, clear, graphic, uh, inventive. I mean, the, I love the little loops down below make the perfect sort of like, um, I mean, it's it. There's no false fronts to it. It is what it is. You're not you're not disguising the masks. You're not um, you're allowing the mask to be the mask and and sort of um, uh, commandeering their element into that motif of the of the curly cue on the curtains. But it's also very figurative. Um, and um, that that's that piece is killer. Um, and I think that you are working well at scale, your work, it strikes me that, um, that the scale is appropriate to, um, your concerns. Um, I love, I love the, uh, the little, um, remote control, uh, in the TV screen that, that's that was very you know that kind of detail yeah <laughs> very cool yeah um so i really uh you know i i i wish you you well i think that um you know the idea of launching a community gallery where you are um y you know it's a great is a great idea. Do you have thoughts about grad school? Um, where did you know? Is that something that might be in the offing at some point? Um, maybe in the future. I'm not very good at academics, so we'll see. I'm gonna I'm gonna travel around and then and then we'll see if if grad school would work out. <laughs> but yeah. Well, I think you've, I mean, you've got, you, you've got a move to make. I mean, you've, you've, you've got this work, you've got this practice and you have this place to bring it back uh, to launch in your community and, you know, taking it one step at a time, I think is um, certainly a very practical and very, you know, viable way of moving forward. Um, but uh, so you're far from stuck you know, you, you uh -huh. speak of being, or you talk about that, but I, I don't, I, I, um, I see the, the trajectory as being, you know, very, very open. And, uh, again, the, uh, that masked curtain, that, that piece is, that's a, that's a punch. That's a terrific piece. Congratulations. Thank you. So <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you, Julia. And now, uh Mia. Hey VZ. I'm uh, sorry you have COVID. I hope you get better soon. Although you do look like you are on the mend. I got it. Yeah, say. I, I like took a shower today. I was like, I have to look nice. Yeah. I need to do this for myself. Yeah. yeah. You you did a great job uh with your presentation. I thought starting us off with the trash bag prom dresses was so brilliant. Um, and I thought they, 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 they looked really good, but they also gave me a clue as to, as to, as to your work and the way you think about work and the way you think about your body and, and, and the layers that, uh, you know, your body and materials and the culture and um, rape culture and fashion and how they all sort of keep informing each other throughout 
the body of work you showed us. I thought you presenting yourself in trash bags as a teenager to kick it off uh, was just, I, I, I loved kicking it off with that um, as so many people, um, you know, so many, so many women, so many girls are very objectified uh, in, in high school prom dress mm. culture all the time. And I love that you just showed up in garbage bags. Um, I, I just thought that that was so punk rock and so smart. And, um, and then you took us right into, um, you know, which I thought was just like a very uh, sort of fluid thread right into the Ha Ha Me Too piece, um, which you showed to us with the, the background of the piece was a bunch of lockers. And I don't know how intentional it was to show us that very powerful work. Um, where every layer of garment that was on there was literally the clothes that were on your body when men made you feel like garbage, treated you like garbage. Um, and you showed us this layered sculptural piece in a, a, like a, a hallway of, of lockers. I don't know where that was. Um, you don't even need to say, oh yeah, that's the only picture I had. So I just used it. Like it, it worked so well. It was so the scene of the crime where I know that so much of that shit is happening. Um, or, you know, maybe happens for the first time, mm -hmm. right? In, in high school hallways, junior high school hallways. I don't know. Um, and then I wanted to say something about the masked curtain piece, which for me, there was like two things going on. At one point you mentioned that it had this relationship to theatrical curtains. Mm -hmm. and, and I was also thinking about this like critique on the media, like the fire hose media, you know, puppet show that we are all forced to endure living in America. The, the blue and the red, and they're both the same and they're both alarmist and they're both giving us the same false, you know, circus of, of lies. And, and then I was thinking about theater and masking. And I was wondering if there was something about like the, there was something in there about mask mandates and the, and the, like sort of the theater of having to wear a mask or I, and I know that sounds a little, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I was just like, was that, was it, I was trying to sort of figure out the connection to theater and wearing a mask. And then I was also responding to the use of the red silk ribbon mm -hmm. and the quilt. And I was thinking about the AIDS quilt and I was thinking about you know HIV AIDS and the red ribbon. And I was just starting to draw connections there, um, thinking about these two pandemics. I don't know if HIV AIDS is considered officially a pandemic um, but I was, I was, I was thinking about that. Um, so I am also very excited that you are going back home. Where, where is home? Uh, Lexington, Kentucky, but I don't plan on like doing that till like 10 years. That's my, that's my goal. Like do all what I said I was going to do Uh huh. in like the far future. So and that and that like dream building will just be waiting for you? Yes. <laughs> right. oh. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Congratulations. I know, I yeah. felt the same way. Yeah, I was like, I, I expect an invitation <laughs> to your residence. my plan. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Oh my God, that was so helpful. All right, if you can stop sharing and then we have for our next speaker, Gordon Fung. Yep. Let me share the screen. Uh, so, hi, I'm Gordon Fung, and I work primarily in transdisciplinary and multimedia arts. 
uh, let me start my video first. Is it working? Yes. Okay. I was formerly trained as a composer and was active between 2009 and to 2017. As early as 2013, my desire to pursue a fine arts career emerged as I saw the restriction in contemporary classical music. Audiences and performers are often homogenous and narrow in terms of music taste. And that puts huge limitation on the experimentation that I could do. It was not until 2019 spring that I tried studio arts out by taking art classes at CCSF. And in fall of 2020, I transferred to CCA. Currently, I'm infusing my expertise and knowledge in music into time-based art. So as to intermarry all the tools I have acquired so far. Speaking of my earliest influence, I was astonished when I first heard John Cage sonatas and interludes for prepared piano during my 11th grade in 2005. Cage was so bold to break through the traditional expectation of classical music, and that becomes an inspiration for me to unearth the sound that is yet to be heard. For influences in arts, I'm inspired by Nam Jun Pei, a pioneer of video arts and a close colleague of Cage's, Ryoji Ikeda, a sound artist, and Rafael Osano Hammer, a multimedia artist. These artists draw heavy influences from updated technologies, data, and programming, and use them to convey statements that would otherwise be unachievable with traditional 2D media. Their attempts have largely expanded the possibility within, within the realm of new media. To push the boundaries in arts, I draw reference from glitch art and noise music in my work. Glitch art and noise music are often considered as underground phenomena and are often enjoyed by only a small group of people. These two genres respectively embrace errors and highly intense sound for aesthetic purposes. And I see the potential of using them in a fine arts context. Also incorporating noise is kind of a statement for how I was restrained as a composer in the past. Now, since I regained my total control of my work, I have to honor my true voice to make the work that I want to hear, to see and to experience. My works also aim to open up a new portal for my viewers in terms of experience in perception and sensation through overwhelming visuals and audio. So here is a brief example of my noise work. So uh, the next example is a brief example of my last major composition that was composed in 2017 and it was premiered in current in 2018. You would immediately recognize the lack of melody and harmony as I explored unconventional instrumental techniques to create unusual tone quality. As you can imagine, my visual works are essentially non-representational and abstract. <laughs> And expanding my interest from music into time-based art, I explored multimedia installation. I made this work beloved gaze in Thai Nong Heart last semester. It is a 12-channel video installation, which disperses the video with four projectors, four monitors, and a large screen. Viewers are encouraged to move freely around the installation to get a more immersive experience. Conventional theme often narrates re representational storyline through uh, post-production and montage. Effects are often added to fool the viewers to believe what they are viewing are real. 
But the use of illusion, which was employed since the discovery of perspective in 2D works, however, offers no help for the viewers to truly understand what reality is. So my video works often question what is reality, and this installation unorthodoxically displays both processed video and their corresponding raw footage. Such simultaneous display is a conceptual metaphor for collapsing and blending the mundane and spiritual worlds. By dismantling these boundaries, I enable my viewers to freely navigate between these meditative moving images through a new form of reality. So here's uh, one of the installation view. And this is the other side of the installation. So the next work, Destructive Memory, features a six channel video that shows archival videos of Angel Island Immigration Station. During 1910 to 40, it was mainly used to detain East Asian immigrants, in particular Cantonese people. For generation loss, I'm degrading the original images to erase them. And also during the process, a lot of unexpected noises are introduced back into the video. This idea of using generation loss dates back to a cyanotype project that I made in 2020 called Loss in Translation in which I repeatedly printed and scanned the image of a carved Chinese poem for 30 times in order to distort and erase it. And this clip is in silence. And for my senior show, it will be on view in IPW in Oakland from May 4th to 6th. The show will feature mainly video projections. And besides Ernest Strohl, another graduating in the senior, and I will be doing an audiovisual performance in Tim Ken Lecture Hall in San Francisco this Friday as an extension of our senior project. And our Audio visual performance will feature me as a video performer and sound mixer, and we will perform electronic music made from field recordings and soundtracks. We see collaboration as a means to expand our practice and expertise, so as to explore how some is greater than individual efforts. As we both are influenced uh, by Flux's artists, we want to revive, if not continue, the zeitgeist and experimentation that Flux's artists had once enjoyed. Starting this fall, Ernest and I will be studying at School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I will be pursuing an MFA in film, new, uh, new media and video to continue working with moving image and multimedia installations. We will continue our collaboration in the form of sound arts, installation, audiovisual works, experimental instruments, and electronic music performance. For performances within two years, we will focus on local and private performance, and after graduation, we will look for opportunities in established venue in the Bay Area, like the Lab Gray Area Center for New Music and Audio in San Francisco, and North Health uh, Noise Fed in Sacramento. I will also look for open calls festivals, residency national wide and internationally, so to have more intellectual ex exchanges with practicing artists. In the long run, I will continue to intermarry analog and digital techniques more freely to seek for some more yet to be found aesthetic and idioms in arts. Last but not least, you can reach me by email or Instagram. And here is my website if you want to check out my other works. Thank you all for attending our thesis talk and let's move on to the discussion. That was great, Gordon. Um, 
So let's see. Uh, I lost track. Who went first last time? It's my turn to go first. Okay, Mia, take it away. Okay, great. Um, huh, Gordon, congratulations on going to Chicago next year with, with your collaborator. I think that is so exciting um, to have met someone uh, in your BFA program who you work so well with and that both of you have gotten into this MFA program is just very, very exciting. Um, I wonder if uh, a name for your collective might emerge. Uh, so you're known as uh, something other than your two names. Um, I don't know, could be, could be interesting. Um, I'm happy that you mentioned the audium. I know I bumped yeah. into you there once or twice. I really think that it's such an incredible venue um, and so unique. And I'm not sure if there's anything quite like it anywhere. So um, it absolutely apply to their residency program. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. As soon as you have some free time, I think that you and Ernest should absolutely apply to that program. I thought your residency, or excuse me, I thought your um, lecture was really good. I am grateful that I was able to hear some of your um, sonic compositions. I, when I hear, when I heard the first piece, I, and of course I, you know, you only gave us like six seconds of it or something or 15 seconds of it maybe but it it did fill me with a little bit of dread um mm. it was i found that it had this sort of heavy prickly spiky texture to it and then to see the later work the installation and I'm, i apologize i didn't see um the installation that you showed us was that your senior show no, that installation was actually in uh, Judy Gilman's class. So I was like ah. hanging it for just a final class show. It was for a yep. critique. So you had yep. sections <laughs> and multiple monitors for the critique. Yeah. Yeah, there was something about hearing the sound while also being able to see like the, was that like a babbling brook or something? Like the water sort of moving over the rocks that, uh, like the tension between this babbling brook that I wasn't hearing and instead I was hearing what sounded like machines grinding or breaking or things being destroyed or damaged. Um, I, I just got this very strong uh, and, and you know this is really from what I was just able to kind of uh, extract from seeing that, you know, moment in, in, in your presentation, but there was just so much of, uh, sort of the, the, um, the Anthropocene, uh, the, the, the human impact on the natural world, the destruction of the natural environment, um, climate chaos. I just sort of got that overwhelming sort of sense from seeing or from hearing that sound juxtaposed with those images. Um, I was thinking about Janet Cardiff, who is a Canadian artist who works with sound a lot, who has produced some of my favorite pieces that I've ever, I've ever uh, experienced. Um, they are sound pieces, but it also frequently involves movement. And sometimes it involves movement through uh, outdoor spaces. There's a little bit of like a journey. It's not necessarily an installation plopped inside of a gallery, but there's something a little bit more, and, and, and there is that as well. There, there, there is some amazing sonic pieces that are plopped inside of galleries that actually she is part of a collective as well with her husband. Mm. Uh, and they work together and produce these really magnificent sonic pieces. Uh, but I've also experienced works where I had to go on a walk and there were sound kind of moments throughout the walk. And um, I wonder if that might be something that you might uh, explore in Chicago is sound works that are sort of out in the world um, 
and they're kind of there's like a, a bit of a like a timeline in it instead of walking into an installation where you just get everything on you all at once but something that kind of reveals itself um was something i was thinking about okay that's great uh, thank you gordon thank congratulations. you congratulations thank you mia so julia thoughts Gordon, there um, we go. Uh, that that was um, wonderful. Um, it was um, the opportunity to um, hear the sonic work uh, is is critical. And um, for me, um, it's it was extraordinarily rich, and um, I responded. Um, uh, it was, it, you know, it just my my it, it was embodied in me the and the extent to which you seem to embrace chaos. Um, that you that we both you're asking us to both look at chaos to the extent you, that you you layer um these uh videos in that sound environment is like you know you know viewing chaos and yet at the same time uh being embodied by chaos um and your, the willingness to look at it and the willingness to be in it is um very powerful very uh for me i think that's very there's a there's a generosity in that there's a the extent to which you you um you how you your practice like offers that is is um fantastic um you know that visual static is a very rich place to to be um and it's speculative i mean you, you know it it certainly your practice seems you know extraordinarily speculative and the and the forms of your expression um completely address that um i quite like the the exposure of the monitors in the installation that again no no false fronts i mean it's like that's both the bones and the skin it's all it's all it's a, it's a body um i thought that that's brilliant um yes to janet cardiff absolutely absolutely i'm sure you must know of her work um i was struck in a way when you when you opened your presentation when you we were looking at the scores and the text and you were and you it was like you were and with the your the little arrow you know it was kind of like you were taking us through you were sort of conducting through that was i don't know whether that was intended um but you know it struck me as that that you were that you were conducting reading through a sort of uh, a score was kind of nice um you know, um, you're you. I, I get um, I sort of go down a, a the damage of time that um, that the work seems to to address. I found myself kind of in a reverie of that. Um, you know, I I, I don't. Um, I just think it's very. Uh, you're in, you're in this, you're in your zone. And uh, I, I mean, I think going forward with your colleague and going to the Art Institute is, is great. I, I just, you know, I really, <clears throat> I can just only say I, I, you know, absolutely love the, 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 the sort of full throated dissonance of, of, of your work is just, it's superb. Congratulations. Yeah, and great thank you, Julia. Wishes. Okay. Thank you, Julia.
That's great. We are ready to move on to our last presentation of the day, which is Eden Cho. All right. Um, let me share my screen. Um, hi, thank you guys for joining me today. Um, my name is Eden Cho and I am currently based in San Francisco. I major in sculpture and I also minor in writing as well. And here I am to share my artistic journey at CCA for the past four years. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in the Bay Area and later immigrated to Taiwan at a young age after my dad got laid off in the early 2000s. I grew up in a abusive household and throughout the first 18 years of my life, I was under survival mode. And it wasn't until college where I began to find my voice and identity. For a while, my chance of growth and curiosity was stripped away from me. I felt as though I had to grow up fast and yet I did not know how to navigate the world around me. While living under that environment, um, illustration was the only thing that was positive in my life and the only thing I had full control over. Um, ever since I was little, drawing became my escape and I drew characters that is seemingly out of the ordinary. As a child, I could I couldn't explain as to why I made these characters. Um, as I was, as I went into my teenage years, they seemed to get even weirder and reflect more on my mental state during that time. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, I began to draw on my bedroom wall, which resulted in my mom to photograph them, and she showed it to her mom Bible study group, and which resulted in my mom. This one day, she came into my room and decided, you know, hey, let's go to the bakery. So we uh, we drove to the, we hopped on the car, she started to drive and for some reason like, wait, we're not going towards the road that's taking us to the bakery. And we ended up in church and resulting me sitting in this small room with this woman who began to speak tongue at me. And that was when I realized I was being exercised. Um, these were the work that I made during my senior year of high school after my dad passed away in 2017. And looking at it now, I see so much anger and so much sadness going on during that period of my life before going into college. Um, these are my artist inspirations. First of all, it's Yayoi Kusama. She is a Japanese artist who lived under a conservative household and that during a time period in Japan where she was only encouraged to marry and give birth and unfortunately her father's continuous her husband and father's continuous affairs and being forced to witness it under her mother's demand as well as being constantly stripped away from an artist's practice left her drive to create to be extremely immense Though, unfortunately, after moving to the U.S. to work towards her career, she tumbled in a cycle of betrayal in the arts world during a time where female artists were rarely celebrated. Um, with many attempts to commit suicide, Kusama brings herself to therapy where the doctors embraced her art and relationship to her trauma. This gave her the will to transform her traumatic experience into a will to create more. And another inspiration of mine is Louise Bourgeois, who is a French American artist who grew up with a father who committed adultery as well and an ill mother who, who died later in her adult life, uh, leaving her abandoning the studies in mathematics for the arts. She later became an immersed in Freud and his teachings of psychoanalysis and trauma. One of her most famous works, The Man, which is an ode to her mother, discusses her early trauma and how it helped her heal from painful memories. And lastly, a huge inspiration ever since middle school is Sylvia Plath. She is a American writer and poet. Um, she is widely known for her autobiographical poems and writings that were honest in the discussion of her trauma and the mania going on her, in her own narrative. Um, written, unfortunately, she did take her life uh, at the age of 30 by inhaling gas from a kitchen stove, though left a collection of poems. Through the many losses in her life, Plath copes with them by making biographical work that hides her relationship with grief, disappointment, and isolation. Um, similar to my own process, all of th three of these artists use their own trauma to translate into art. 
And instead of dwelling on to their own life experience, they made work that allowed them to process their trauma. Even though there are times where my memories become unbearable, um, I am inspired by their willpower power, and I wish to heal while making art because I don't want to be stuck in that victim mentality, which I have before a couple of years back. And it wasn't until recently where I decided that I want to take control over my happiness in my own life. Um, so these are going into CCA first thing. I came in as an illustrator because that's thought that's the only thing that I was exposed to and only practice that I've done ever since I was a child. Um, and this, when I first came in, I, I was still grieving looking back at it now. And this was a zine that I made um, talking about how I felt when my dad just passed away. And this was the first assignment during my freshman year in my 3D class that made me want to move beyond the 2D realm. This assignment was about, um, was to make three nuggets using felt and make something personal. And so I decided to uh, make a pack of cigarettes and a plastic plant that I bought for myself from Ikea, the first thing moving into the dorm freshman year. And the reason for a pack of cigarettes was because, you know, my dad, he was a really heavy smoker. And at the time I despised any, I despised cigarettes, I despised nicotine. And ironically, after he passed away, I became one myself. And this is what I've been, I was doing when I was in the illustration department. I didn't understand as to why I was making work like this because I, everything was taught about, think about the client, think about what's gonna sell, think about form and nothing about it was who I am and who I could be as an artist and how do I process that? So I feel like subconsciously I kind of put in a bit of my personality into this art, this illustration that I, I don't, didn't even understand at the time. And I started pushing it and I started to think more about my identity and who I am and figuring that out. And this is the first, after a year and a half, the second semester of my sophomore year, I decided to switch to sculpture because I thought initially I thought it, it's going to allow me to learn as many material as possible and to push beyond the 2D realm and go three dimensionally. Um, this assignment was um, actually an assignment from Mia Foyer. Um, she was the first the first class I took um, as a sculpture major, and I was assigned to the word narcissism, and I made my response to it by building a giant pink dick. And but I, as I been going on I don't know I didn't know how to put push forward with this kind of kind of stuff it didn't feel relevant and then the pandemic hit and I, I didn't I stopped creating I stopped making work and I began to write a lot more and more I was writing poems um, my first and second year of college and I have these scrap pieces that I put together and added more to it so the past two years I was working on this large s this huge essay that I think I, I will be continuing writing. Um, and so I decided to make my thesis in response to that essay. And I made this huge, um, huge piece that is really cool to see what I am capable of making. However, it doesn't feel relevant to who I am as a person, to my identity, to my artistic practice. But I, I am grateful and I am humbled to be able to understand more of what I can do and what I'm capable of. Um, so I decided to scratch my entire concept of my thesis. The idea is still the same, which is regard to my identity and the question, the constant evolving of who I am and who I could be. So I, I made these three pieces and this is what it looks like in the gallery. These are all uh, self portraits of myself and how I have been drawing myself since ever since coming into college. And this piece specifically is regarding my the isolation, the process of going since a kid till now. I feel like it's so hard to have people understand how 
you know, my own experience, how it goes. And I feel like in a way I invalidated myself constantly and I just feel so isolated and depressed. And I, and I sometimes don't even fully understand what I'm going through. And it's such a, such an isolating experience. So, um, and this, these two pieces actually go together. Um, it's me just looking at different sides of myself. And the reason why I have so many portraits just looking of me looking at each other is because I'm just constantly looking back and looking at my old self and it's just gonna keep going and going and going and it's never ending. Um, so my future plan after graduation is I, I wanna take some time and just take care of myself and make work for a year and just produce as much as I can, heal as much as I can and get some proper help. Um, and then hopefully after a year, I can start applying for grad schools and through, before that maybe even apply to open calls and residencies as well. Thank you. Thank you, Eden. That was great. So, I think it's Julia's turn to go first. Hi, Eden, and uh, congratulations. Um, your uh, presentation is very moving. Um, you, it's, I felt um, great empathy uh, for, for your journey to um, sort of land, uh, you know, on some kind of firm ground as an artist. And, um, you know, uh, I can only say it is a journey and um, it's one that we, that, you know, isn't, there isn't a timeline, there isn't, uh, you know, uh, that, you, that, that we necessarily get it when we think we should or when, it, when we think it's expected of us. Um, you know, we get to our truths when we get to them. And um, there's, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of strengths in your work in terms of of um, just your ability to um, to imbue graphic energy. I mean, just if you break things down, regardless of of um, subject or content, just formally your ability to uh, create a strong graphic mark is like that in and of itself is a is a place to 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 uh, maybe start from, as well as I was very much struck by the sculpture, those, um, uh, was it paper mache or cement, those, you said they, they had nothing to do with what you viewed in terms of your identity as an artist, but they were these abstract sort of like uh, big slices of sort of like uh, melons, or I mean, they had a, a that were large discs, those were, those were very powerful. Uh, I didn't need to know what they were. Um, I was just struck by their physicality and their robustness. The fact that, that, that you're able to um, create such a um, manifestly powerful uh, object, despite fragility, perhaps, uh, it, you know, in terms of identity is, um, is huge. I mean, it's like there's that, you know, your voice is there. Um, your, your, the, um, the mechanisms to, to, uh, to express that voice are definitely there. Um, you know, I uh, 
I just have um, a, a feeling for where you are. Um, you know, I think um, just, I, I, maybe, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> think it, just making the work, following the, following the forms of the work, following the, the, you know, find the, find the footprint in the, in the process, in the, uh, just in putting together the forms. Um, maybe that can be enough rather than to be, uh, you know, thinking about an overall, you know, my identity is this and, 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 and you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, um, our identities sometimes get put together uh, on a daily basis. Um, I, I thought it was very funny going back to the uh, beginning that the cock was set along a shelf of like food that looked like it was in a kitchen on a kitchen shelf uh, next to like a jar of olives or something. I thought that was pretty strange and pretty great. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, it was a great job and uh, I wish you well and um, congratulations. All right, thank you. So. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Okay, great. Uh, congrats, Eden. That was, uh, that was a really great lecture. Um, I'm really interested in art as a tool for healing, as medicine, as a tool for escapism, um, and, 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 as, and as therapy, as a way for you to work through, work through trauma, for, for, for all of us to work through trauma. I'm, I found myself imagining you in, you know, when you're ready for graduate school to go into an art therapy program um, to find some radical art therapy program. So instead of just chasing after an MFA, it is an MFA that has, and I don't know that much about art therapy programs, but I'm interested to sit down. I, I would sit down with you and do a little research about it if it's something you wanna just consider. I think you're open to that. And I, and I think that your writing is very sculptural and I think it, it's, we didn't really get much of your writing in, in this lecture. It was more of a focus on your visual art, but I think your writing is stunning and beautiful and, and, and so visual actually, and almost cinematic. And I've had the opportunity to listen to you read what you wrote many times over the last few years. Um, I think it's interesting that your practice in a way is, is almost, or, or your time at CCA has almost been cyclical, starting with these black and white, very graphic zines of these characters that are sort of distorted and kind of like um, carnival-esque funhouse mirror sort of um, fluid bodies. Um, and then you dabbled in, I think, some construction and some making and some building, which um, I thought some of those works, that that piece that, you know, the large scale piece that you showed in the gallery in Oakland, I thought that that was just such a tremendous success and you performing in it, you know, you didn't mention that in your lecture, but I, I, I will always remember that. I thought that was such a great uh, way to interact with that large scale sculpture. My family just walked in, so I'm gonna like be like a little bit distracted for a moment. Um, I, uh, but that final painting that you made for your show, the one that it was a little bit more minimal and it was horizontal and it involved the paper clay texture on the body as well. 
I can see it very clearly because I've looked at it several times. I hope that everyone knows what I'm talking about. There were three main pieces in your final show and I'm talking about the one that was not, uh, did, didn't have the relationship necessarily to the character on the floor, but the other one, there was like a sophistication to that piece that was very quiet and was very haunting. And it's, I, I love that that's where all your time at CCA kind of took you sort of back to the beginning, but sort of in an elevated way. And you introduced the use of the paper clay and the texture and there was something so tragic about that piece. It was like this tiny corpse floating into an oblivion with an umbilical cord coming out of their head. And I, I just really loved, I was really moved by that piece. And I'm curious for you, I, I just wanna know what comes next. I think it's good you're taking a break. I think it's, it's, Hi, Bubs. I think I think it's really good that you're not like off to grad school right now. Like I, I think it's good to slow down and to take some time and to breathe. Um, and yeah, congratulations. Really, congratulations. Big, big, huge congratulations, Eden. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And <clears throat> I guess. That brings us to the end of this presentation. And I wanna say a huge thank you to everyone for attending today, and especially to you five students, to Mia and to Julia. The recording of this event will be available in a few days on YouTube. I'll show a little uh, round of applause, I'm trying to turn off my timer. Thank you, everybody. And bye-bye. Uh,